good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our uh, monthly seminar that organized by the Division of Mental Health Society. My name is uh, Xiang Fei Meng. I'm the director of uh, Mental Health Society Division. So uh, this is our uh, monthly event. And we actually have this event back to uh, 2019. And because of the COVID, so we stopped the, the seminars during the pandemic period. And now we uh, have the seminar back. And from January, uh, we already start to have a different research topics. And just to give you a very brief intro about our division. So our division has the mandate to contribute to advancement of knowledge in psychological social aspects of mental health. And by increasing knowledge about the best ways to organize mental health services and pathological addictions, we want to articulate social, cultural, economic factors that contribute to mental health problems and addictions in diverse populations. And we want to promote policy development guidance and improve uh, mental health services. There are actually 15 uh, members in the division, as you see from the website of the uh, Douglas Research Center. And each member has unique strengths and capacity to run different research projects. Because of the limited, in the interest of the time, I won't go into details about individual researchers in our division. But if you're interested, definitely go into their website and they have a lot of detailed information about individual researchers. So before I invite Dr. Darcy to give our presentation, I just want to give a very brief introduction about Dr. Darcy. Dr. Darcy is a researcher and professor from Department of Psychiatry College of Medicine and School of Public Health at the University of Saskatchewan. And he also a uh, academic director of Saskatchewan Research Data Center, short for SkyRDC, which is a joint University of Saskatchewan and Statistic Canada research data platform. And Dr. Darcy involved in teaching research uh, concerning mental health illnesses and chronic diseases. And he supervised almost 50 uh, graduate students and postdoc fellows in those areas has been very, uh, you know, productive and also a prestigious researchers in the field of uh, psychiatric epidemiology and social epidemiology. And he published widely and up to 150 publications in those, you know, peer reviewed articles. And he also received a number of uh, grants from different you know, uh, grant agencies. And right now he's sitting on a number of those national international grant agencies. So without further delay, I would want to pass the, uh, the floor to Dr. Darcy. Thank you very much, uh, Sean Bay. I appreciate that kind introduction. And I'd like to thank you and the Douglas and McGill for inviting me to present on the prevention of common mental disorders. I'm going to take about 45 minutes uh, to make my presentation and then I'm certainly open to answers or sorry, questions. I'm supposed to give the answers uh, afterwards. So what I'm going to talk about is the burden of mental disorders, why we prevent, some basic rules uh, about uh, prevention uh, and, what are, and sort of provide a very global view of what we've learned from epidemiological studies. I want to talk about risk factors for mental disorders. I want to talk about how we can prioritize interventions. Uh, and I also want to talk about effective interventions and some future work that we should do with respect to uh, preventing uh, and programs to prevent uh, common mental disorders. Uh, I think as we all know, those mental disorders are a great burden both uh, for the society as a whole, but also for families and friends and from the individual they affect. The global burden of disease uh, studies certainly indicate that they are a leading cause of uh, disability worldwide and are linked to increasing physical illness and premature mortality. Developed countries, uh, I would like to point out, developed countries have made great stride in reducing morbidity and mortality from some chronic diseases. And I consider 
common mental disorders in that category of chronic diseases. If we look at cardiovascular disease, cerebrovascular disease, and some cancers, we've made very effective uh, uh, inroads in reducing the incidence of those diseases. And those are largely come about through the prevention strategies aimed at the general population. This is data on uh, stroke age standardized uh, by uh, uh, for over the time period 203 to 216. And if we actually extended this data backwards uh, into the 1990s, we would see that this has been a continuing pattern over time. Uh, the top line is males, they, uh, we have more strokes. Females are the blue line on the bottom and the population level is throughout. So these are age standardized rates, which means that the change in composition of the Canadian population hasn't interfered with them. So we've made substantial strides in reducing stroke. Uh, and if we look at ischemic uh, heart disease, again, we find a similar pattern. Again, uh, males have higher rates of heart disease, women have less, but in both uh, group, uh, genders, they've gone down. And in fact, if we look at um, data on age groups, they've also gone down in all age groups, but I won't present that here. And this is again data on lung cancer and the top line, which uh, here is the age standard incidence rates. These are age standardized mortality rates. These are males, these are females. And you can see that the decline in mortality from lung cancer has gone down uh, in Canada since the 1990s for males. For females, it's a little later, but it's now going down. And the real reason for the change in pattern, uh, overall pattern in decreasing lung cancer is that we've been effective in terms of prevention efforts aimed at reducing the primary risk for uh, lung cancer, which is smoking. And the reason that women have a little delayed in their response is that women started smoking later and there's sort of a 30 year um, uh, incubation period between the initiating of smoking and the development of lung cancer. So we've made, uh, I want to talk about the public health to, to, uh, toolbox and we've made those uh, changes in terms of uh, cardiovascular disease and lung cancer in terms of using a variety of techniques. We've obviously altered food in terms of low salt, low fat. In terms of smoking, we've limited where you can smoke, age of smoking, advertisement bans, display limitations on bans on smoking in movies and TVs. We also have tax, tax policies where we uh, make it expensive to smoke. And there's also a large amount of social and desirability, social marketing, the social desirability of smoking, increasing physical activity and diet, and diet recommendations. But we also have increased our knowledge about what the risk factors for disease are. We've also increased public awareness about blood pressure, about the risk factors for lung cancer. And we've even developed new ideas that we didn't talk about 40 years ago, like secondhand smoke and some people talk about uh, third-hand smoke. In terms of things, the social changes in habits and behaviors, uh, in 1965, probably more than 60% of males in Canada smoked. Today, the rate is around 18%. So the, the point to be made there is that we can change behavior and behavior does change. Where well, I was an undergraduate at the University of Saskatchewan, uh, there was ashtrays on every desk and everybody smoked, it seemed to me. Now you're not allowed to smoke within 50 feet of the buildings. However, I don't see the same kind of similar in men initiatives for public mental health. They haven't, we haven't un uh, undertaken those kind of uh, uh, actions for, for uh, common mental disorders. And if we look at the data on the use of mental health services for alcohol and drug and use disorders, looking at that period from 2000 to 2016, we can see it's relatively flat uh, over time. The higher rates in blue are females 
and the lower rates are males. And that is sort of a very traditional epidemiological finding. Certainly rates of anxiety and depression are higher in females than in males, but of course males have higher rates of um, alcohol and drug problems and also um, conduct, uh, sorry, antisocial personality kinds of problems. And the other thing pushing, for, at least in my mind, for more uh, public health interventions is that drug interventions have limited effectiveness. And some of the more effective therapies like cognitive behavioral therapies uh, can be effective in treating, but they're costly and time consuming. And I think we need to think of developing uh, population-based uh, interventions that intervene before the occurrence of disease. You might ask why we bother to prevent. I mean, there are economic reasons usually cited and human humanitarian and ethical reasons, and there's practical reasons. I'm not sure there's too much in terms of economic reasons, because I guess some people would argue the cheapest patient is a dead patient, and that's a rather cynical argument. But um, practical argument for looking at preventing mental illness is the size of the problem. Approximately 10% of the Canadian population's report suffering from mental disorders over the past 12 months. And there's some suggestion that that may be increasing in certain populations, particularly among adolescents. And I think the need for services far outstrip the manpower available are likely to be available in the future. I know in our, at, in Saskatoon, where I live, the, there's a wait list for uh, child psychiatric interventions, child psychiatry appointments of more than a year. And I always think that a year in the life of a child is an extremely long time. And we need to make uh, actions available earlier and to reduce the occurrence of uh, mental health problems. And I think uh, only, uh, even in developed countries, I think the only option for us is to uh, provide uh, interventions, prevention interventions to reduce the, the demand for services. And I think there's a humanitarian ar argument about why we should prevent uh, mental disorders. I think it's better to be healthy than ill or dead. And I think that's the sort of beginning and the end of the argument. I think there's sufficient argument to uh, use Rothman's term, and I think it's the best argument. Some basic rules about prevention I, I want to talk about. Uh, I think we make a distinction between prevention and treatment. Uh, prevention is intervention before the occurrence of a disease. Control, public health talks about control and that's intervention after the uh, disease has occurred and is designed to reduce the impact and disability of a disease. Um, so we seek to prevent the occurrence of a health problem uh, and we seek to limit the impact of a health problem from a public health perspective. And I think it's important to realize that effective prevention can occur in the absence of uh, detailed knowledge about the cause of the disease. In epidemiology, there's the classic uh, story about uh, snow and water contamination in cholera in London and how he understood that the uh, wells that people were using, the pumps that people were using were a source of contamination, but he had no idea what the nature of cholera was or how it was caused. And I think we can make the same kind of argument about smoking and lung cancer. We're not as sure about all the specifics of how smoking is linked to lung cancer but we certainly know that preventing smoking does reduce lung cancer, as I showed previously. And I think more recently, when we've had the AIDS epidemic, we weren't sure how or what AIDS was. We didn't know about HIV, but we did know it was a, a largely, a, initially a sexually transmitted disease and that blood to blood contact was important. So we developed a whole bunch of uh, prevention strategies based on safe sex and so forth. 
and needle now needle exchange programs. Um, we don't need to know all the parameters of a disease in order to effectively intervene, but we do have to have knowledge of a risk factor, at least one that are related to the occurrence of disease. And of course, more knowledge that we have improves the chances for more effective intervention. And, but also at the same time, I think we can, should realize that maybe not all disorders uh, and problems are amenable to public in, uh, health intervention. And by public health intervention, I'm talking about mass interventions in the population at large. I'm not sure we should go around and offer prophylactic appendectomies, but. So when I'm talking about common mental disorders, I'm talking about depression, anxiety, phobias, substance abuse, alcohol, and drug abuse. And they are the a major cause of disability and mortality uh, in Canada and worldwide. Uh, and I think those common mental disorders are amenable to public health interventions and perhaps more amenable than uh, some of the psychotic disorders. As I said before, in terms of public health, we don't treat single individuals. So we're not talking about clinical practice so per se. We're talking about programs that treat groups of people, collectivities, uh, communities. And in terms of public health interventions, we have provincial, national, and international programs, as we can witness today in terms of the uh, vaccination programs vis-a-vis -vis the COVID uh, uh, pandemic. Um, and I said, as I said earlier, we want to limit the impact of the program uh, and the intervention should be less disabling or hard, harmful and disease or problems that we seek to present, and it should be cost effective. So what do I think we've learned from epidemiological studies of mental health that could lead us to areas where we can uh, begin to think about preventing uh, mental disorders? Well, first of all, we know about the size of the problem. This is data from the Canadian Community Mental Health Survey of 212, which is the most recent one we have where you can see that the prevalence of, this is 12 months prevalence of various kinds of psychiatric disorders and any mood and substance disorder, you're looking at 10.1%. And if you're looking at, uh, this is 5% or, or more than 5% for depression, 2.6% uh, for uh, anxiety disorders, substance abuse disorders, you're looking at 4.4%. Um, and these are lifetime prevalences of those diseases. So we're clear that there's a sizable problem in terms of uh, those common mental disorders, those depression, anxiety, and drug and uh, abuse, uh, substance abuse. Um, the other thing I think that the literature shows is that these problems start at a relatively age, so early age. So there's an early age of onset uh, of mental health problems. It's true that some mental disorders may run in families. Some disorders may have a genetic component or a, an increased susceptibility to stress. We certainly know that certain social conditions and stresses can lead to mental disorders. And some disorders have, may result in the epigenetic events, gene and environment interventions, uh, sorry, interactions. We should also be know that comorbidity uh, in, in not only among uh, psychiatric disorders, but also between psychiatric disorders and physical disorders exist. In, in epidemiological literature, we really talk about risk factors associated with the increase of a disease. Uh, we don't usually talk about causal, but we sort of implied it. And the reason we don't talk about causes is that we don't do randomized control trials to see what are the causes of mental disorders. I'm not sure it would or that it would be practical or ethical to do a randomized control of uh, childhood abuse to see what effect it has on the population. 
So we talk about risk factors for mental disorders. Those risk factors certainly can be genetic. Uh, they can be epigenetic, but they also can be psychological and social. And we can talk about social stresses. And we also can talk about resilience factors, such as coping strategy and problem solving skills that uh, help us mitigate stresses or deal with stresses and provide us with some resilience. There's a, a model that I like to think of and use in terms of looking at mental health and mental illness. It's called a biopsychosocial model. So you have the biological uh, sphere here, we have the social sphere here, and we have the psychological. In terms of biological, we're talking about physical health, genetic vulnerability, uh, comorbidities. We're, in terms of social environment, we're looking at socioeconomic status, culture, family, circumstances. And in terms of psychological factors, we're looking at self-esteem, coping skills, temperament, and so forth. In terms of risk factors, we tend to classify risk factors in sort of two ways, modifiable risk factors that are sorry, non-modifiable risk factors, which are highly susceptible, sorry, highly resistant to change and some cannot be changed at an individual line. On the other hand, we talk about modifiable risk factors that we can certainly modify and control and treat. And in terms of modifiable risk factors, again, genetic age, we generally can't change our age or our gender. But there are other modifiable risk factors that we can change. We can change early childhood experience. We can increase physical activity. We can change diet. We can change smoking. And we can change excessive alcohol consumption. Um, now, some generic, some risk factors are generic and they protect against a range of common, uh, or sorry, they're common to several diseases. Certainly childhood abuse has been seen to contribute to depression, anxiety, substance abuse, and PTSD. Some are uh, risk factors are more specific, sort of negative thinking is more closely tied to depression. Another thing I think is important to recognize about risk factors is that a simple thing, the more you have of them, the greater the risk. This is some a study that I did with uh, Dr. Mung uh, a long time ago, and we looked at the uh, number of common risk factors and related it to the probability of having a mood and anxiety disorders. And this was data again from a national survey of mental health. And as you can see on this uh, graph, the more uh, risk factors they have, the greater the chance of uh, developing a mood and anxiety disorder. And some of the risk factors we're talking about here are uh, ones like age and gender and education and so forth. Now, risk factors from my perspective provide us with uh, leverage points for prevention. Reducing the level of a risk factor or increasing the level of a protective factor should lead to the reduction of, of, a, of disease. This is data from the, uh, or some data from the uh, WHO from one of their studies on the risks to mental illness. And they talk about risk factors in terms of individual attributes, social circumstances and environmental factors. And on the red column here, we have the risk factors and on the green factor here, uh, column here, we have the protective factor. And obviously, we have uh, individual attributes, um, low self-esteem, difficulty in communicating. Whereas on the positive side, we have self-esteem, positive self-esteem, ability to solve problems and manage stress, communication skills, physical health and fitness. And in terms of social circumstances, we can talk about work stress, unemployment, and on the positive side, we can talk about achievement and satisfaction at work. Um, and in terms of environment, we can talk about 
uh, social and general gender inequalities in that society, exposure to war and disaster. And on the positive sides, we can talk about uh, social justice, tolerance, integration, and a general e e equality. And it's important to recognize that these risk factors may occur and may have more impact at different stages of the life course. Uh, certainly malnutrition and attachment insecurity are much more important in prenatal period and, er and early childhood. Um, psychoactive substance use obviously starts usually late, later in adolescence and in adulthood. And in terms of older people, uh, elders, you can de deal with issues of bereavement and uh, the uh, accretion of the uh, of chronic health the disease as the primary risk factor for chronic disease as we grow older is age. In terms of prevention efforts, we usually like to talk about uh, universal ones, the ones that target the general population. But we also can talk about selective ones that target groups of individuals who are at increased risk of developing disease. And of course, there are indicated ones, ones that where we look, we target people who have detectable symptoms of disease or biological markers for disease. So how do we go about prioritizing uh, actions? Uh, and I think there's two ways we can think of it, at least in my way. One is the proportional attributable fractions, which is a statistical technique. And the other one is, I think if we take a life course perspective and understand that when we intervene, if we intervene early in life, that maybe we will alter the trajectory that which people go through. So proportional attributable fractions, uh, really what it says is that uh, if we reduce a certain risk factor in the population by a certain amount, it will reduce the occurrence of a disease, uh, a similar or a, a, another amount. And then, so if we reduce cigarette smoking in a population, we can then estimate that, that in the, the following decades, we will see reductions in lung cancer. So uh, Dr. Lee uh, and uh, Dr. Mung and myself, we did a study on the effect of childhood maltreatment on adult mental disorders. And this was a systematic review of prospective cohort studies. And I think what is clear here is that you can see that the um, risk of adult mental disorder is increased in people who have ex experienced childhood maltreatment. And what's interesting about this particular study is that we just looked at uh, prospective studies where we're not dealing with recall of abuse at a, uh, among adults, but rather that the abuse was measured early in ch uh, childhood. And then those people went on to develop uh, mental uh, psychiatric disorders. And using that kind of perspective, uh, we were able to estimate on a worldwide basis, the kinds of reductions that you could expect in depression and anxiety if we got rid of um, physical abuse or sexual abuse. And these are 10% reductions in the occurrence of abuse and 25% of the reductions in the occurrence of abuse. Uh, this is a, another study with uh, Dr. Mong and myself where we looked at uh, statistically significant risk factors for first episode depression uh, in a national longitudinal cohort study. And it was over a 16 year period. And what was came out of that study was that the risk factors were age, um, drinking, uh, smoking, having a, a chronic disease and low income. And on the basis of that data, you could estimate the number of uh, number of depression cases that would be reduced if we change those risk factors 
um, by 10%. So if we reduce poor income by 10%, we're looking at all oh, 35% fewer uh, total cases of uh, depression. But if we re reduce smoking, we can see we're looking up at around 70%, 70,000 cases and so forth. And clear again in this picture, which I think is important is that the more risk factors we reduced, the greater the reduction in depression occurred. From a life course perspective, I think early risk exposure sets a tra trajectory for health and illness, illness. So interventions should ideally, uh, ideally occur early before risk factors and diseases become permanent. There are a variety of uh, studies that suggest that there are a number of effective uh, illness prevention that works. Um, there are certainly evidence-based resources and reviews. Uh, there's the WHO uh, Intervention and Policy Options, which was written in 2004. The UK has a Foresight Mental Health Capital and Wellbeing Project, which produced a, a good number of studies. And there's the Data Prev, Prev project of the European Commission, which produced various work packages on effective strategies with respect to parenting, workplace, uh, and schools, and so forth. And the intervention early in life sort of takes that development origin of health and disease perspective. Certainly preconception and pre pregnancy provide important opportunities for primary mental health prevention. Not only physical mental health, uh, health prevention, but also mental health prevention. Good maternal health and nutrition is essential for the developing fetus. And taking into account that sort of uh, development origin of disease, this is data from a graduate student of uh, mine, Dr. Sorry, Miss Sue, and also with Dr. Mao, and we looked at the effect, uh, the transmission of maltreatment. So, does maternal childhood maltreatment affect an off their offspring psychopathology? And what is clear in this particular study is that there is a small to medium uh, effect size that a mother who has experienced maltreatment herself will have, or that will be also be translated into offspring psychopathology. So that means we should effectively intervene, uh, sorry, inter, um, intervene with <clears throat> mothers who have exper uh, experienced childhood maltreatment. Um, this is a, another study with that same group. Uh, and we looked at, uh, took a uh, systematic review, again, of prospective studies, looking at prenatal and perinatal risk factors for depression. And you can see that and these are significant risk factors that we found in the review of the literature. Low birth weight, premature birth, parenting, par young parents, old parents. In terms of psychological factors, there's maternal stress, ma maternal depression, anxiety. In terms of more social factors, ed there's education, low economics, uh, smoking, paternal smoking, maternal smoking. Those are all significant risk factors that are, are present in the literature about risk factors that lead to the development of depression. And I think it's also, when we talk about risk factor, I think it's also a pos uh, positive to talk about uh, protective factors. So this is again, some work from Mang et al. and other people at the Douglas Hospital. And we talk about individual factors, coping strategy, education. These are very good positive factors. In terms of self-perceived factors, a sense of control, attachment, 
self-esteem, those are important factors. Certainly familial factors are important, early family environment, living with parents, positive parenting skills. Also in community factors, having other adults that are caring, having teachers that are supportive, having social support, those are all important risk factors. And what these protective factors do is they help us mitigate, understand, or they mitigate against our reactions to stress. They allow us to cope better with stress factors. Stress factors are always a come. Stressful, stressful situations are always going to occur. The important thing is how we are going to respond to those stresses. So what kind of strategies we should do? Well, certainly in terms of pregnant women, I think we should discourage alcohol use, particularly uh, binge drinking, smoking, uh, illicit drug prescription use, certainly want to decrease the likelihood of low birth weight and uh, premature birth. Uh, and we should pay attention to mothers who have been themselves abused. Um, we have a focus on parenting. Um, I think uh, focus on parenting, we can talk about less warmth, parental conflict, over-involvement in ch children, adverse, hostile interactions between child and parent, less autonomy granting and excessive monitoring. And that's the report that comes out of a Delphi study done by Yap et al. And it's in the Journal of Affective Disorders. Let me go back just to one step here to uh, uh, talking about uh, pregnant women. I think it's important. We we have courses on, you know, prenatal courses, uh, helping people to deal with the expectation of arriving a child arriving. But perhaps we also need uh, courses that deal with parenting after the child has come, so we can provide clear information and guidelines on how to deal with. Uh, the child as that child grows up. The European Data Rev project concluded that parenting programs had great potential for improving the mental health of the next generation. And as I said earlier, parenting classes as a public health intervention. There are on the internet some interesting parenting programs and parenting information. And this is an Australia, Australian website that I think provides useful and validated information. Schools provide a unique opportunity for illness prevention and mental health promotion. Uh, effective school programs, and this is based on a review by Ware and Nind. And is that we can teach skills, social and emotional learning, we can teach coping strategies, we can stress positive mental health. And I think in terms of effective school-based program, they have to start early with the youngest children and continue with the oldest children. And the program should be embedded in the school. So they shouldn't be set aside and separate, but they should be part and integral to the school pro curriculum. And they have to be in implemented with fidelity and intensity. So they have to be actually implemented as they were described and, and have been found to be effective. They need to have well-defined goals and explicit outcomes. And of course, quality control is, is very important. I think mental health literacy is seen as a good starting point for school-based prevention and mental health prevention. Uh, mental health promotion and mental illness prevention programs. In, in terms of the adult and workplace intervention, physical activity is seen as uh, promising prevention. And I, certainly there's data showing a link between levels of physical activity and mental health. And of course, workplaces like schools provide opportunities to improve physical uh, and mental health. 
workplace interventions that have it taking place usually have a lot of aims. One is sort of better stress management and coping strategies, mental health improvement, increased job satisfaction, improved job performance. And of course, the organization is certainly interested in improving job performance and reducing aptism, absenteeism. Hmm. Um, so the types of workplace interventions that have found to be effective are, are skills training, improving workers' qualification and education, relaxation techniques, mindfulness, physical activities, and certainly multi-component intervention. Stress inoculation and stress management programs have been seen as promising intervention. And there's a review of those workplace intervention by Kazabla et al. in the journal Health Promotion International. Uh, in terms of preventing and reducing mental illness in older per, uh, adults, particularly adults in residentiary, residential settings, meaningful social activities tailored to individuals' abilities and preference have been consistently improved, found to improve the mental health of older adults. Programs to support activities, to support social activities, peer support, skill training have also been found to reduce depression symptoms and depression in older adults. And certainly for older adults with chronic diseases and functional limitation, it's important to provide information about the external aids that are available, the resources that are available to help them deal with their physical health problem, and to also to promote personal resources and coping strategies. And I think it's very important to limit negative thoughts that may occur in those situations. Improving mental health literacy is uh, certainly would be a very much a large important uh, mental health, uh, public mental health program. I think it's well established that self-help can reduce symptoms of dep uh, depression and anxiety. Uh, in the olden days when we had uh, books and written material, there's a very interesting book, a self-help book by a noted British psychiatrist called Isaac Mark on living with fear and basically dealing with fear, anxiety, and phobias. And now with the internet and smartphones, we have a lot of associated e-health technologies that are transforming the way in which people can access healthcare information and seek help and engage in self-care. I think we underestimate the uh, importance of self-care in helping people deal with uh, mental health problems. There are a variety of places one can go to look at programs that have dealt or uh, have evaluated various kinds of uh, digital therapy programs. Uh, the, the NICE organization in the US, sorry, in the UK, in the United Kingdom provide some very detailed evaluations of the effectiveness of various kind of both self-help treatment programs, but also uh, uh, digital therapy programs that are uh, an adjunct to clinical intervention. The uh, One Mind Cyber Guide in the US provides a very useful guide, guide to a plethora of apps that are out there in the world. Um, there are online treatment programs. Uh, the Australians seem to have done a very good job in developing a, a, a number of uh, uh, internet-based uh, therapy programs, both for children and adolescents themselves and for, for adults. So there's Beyond Blue, the Blue Gym, uh, the Black, Black Dog Institute. And as I've talked about earlier, there's the Parenting Strategies ne Network. And research has found that these internet programs have had high levels of consumer acceptance and adherence. There are also smartphone apps that are available that are very good. Uh, 
in terms of looking at mindfulness as a way to control anxiety and, uh, and maybe even help reduce panic attacks. Mindfulness, uh, breed to is one strategy that we talk about in, in, and has been talked about in the literature. The breed to relax uh, app is very good. Uh, and the smiling bind one are again, these are apps that deal with uh, meditation and the certainly the breed to relax one emphasizes using breathing techniques to reduce levels of anxiety and the sam project uh, out of the university of west england deals with anxiety and it's a fairly detailed and rigorous uh, application uh, app and the important thing about these apps and what i like about it is they're free and there's no in-app purchases and they're available for iPhone and ad uh, Android devices. So in the future, where should we go with this? I think we need to expand the evidence base for prevention of mental illness and for the promotion of mental health. We need more evidence. Uh, we need pragmatic, high quality, multi-site studies of, uh, uh, that demonstrate the rob robustness of intervention programs. And we certainly need longitudinal studies that demonstrate the impact of interventions aimed at the population at large. So we need to have clear demonstration that these interventions, particularly interventions that start early in life, have long lasting impact on, on, on people. So what are my conclusions? Well, common mental disorders, I think, are preventable, or certainly a large percentage of them are preventable. We have evidence and powerful tools on which to base prevention programs. I think we need to sort of fully recognize this and communicate that to providers, policymakers, and the general public. And I think most importantly, we need to act now to prevent mental disorders. The time is now. In thinking about this talk, I sort of was reminded of a line from a poem of the famous British poet, Williams Wordsworth, that writes, the child is father to the man. And I think it's important to recognize that characters and characteristics are our character and traits that we form as children stay with us into adult life and i think every child deserves a good start in life starting in the womb and going on to childhood and adolescence and a good start in life i think leads to a, a better adulthood and i'll leave it there thank you merci thank you very much dr darcy and this is a very comprehensive and informative uh, presentation you know gave a comprehensive uh, example not by demonstrating the gap of the preventive perspective and also providing both life perspective and also the you know many different aspects of the life that intervene that could be the target for the intervention prevention and uh, so now we open for the discussions i see we have uh, several questions already coming from the chat so maybe I will read the, the question first. Yeah, so I we have a qu the yeah. question is, what standardized the tools would you recommend to screen for mental health in the adult population with chronic diseases such as cardiometabolic or pain? Uh, they are looking into integrate them into their interdisciplinary team approach. Um, obviously, uh, pain depends on what kind of pain it is, and uh, uh, certainly the literature suggests that yes, a, an interdisciplinary approach, approach is important. And I think uh, managing pain means uh, understanding that pain and uh, to some extent living with the pain. And I think, yes, I mean, I think it's a uh, a cognitive behavioral approach would be important to doing in doing that. Does that answer that question? 
I think the question was trying to look for the standardized the tools to identify our screen for mental health issues among people with, you know, other comorbid physical health complaints. You mean looking for a tool to see whether people have those? Mental health problems. Uh, I can't think of anything but sort of standard ones like, uh, 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 what is it called? Uh, 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 PHQ-9. PHQ, yeah, those kinds of things. There's a, there's a lot of standard screening scales and they tend to be very much the same and you would screen for anxiety, you would screen for, for depression, yes. Yeah, we have a PHQ-9 quite often used in people with comorbid physical and mental health problems. Yeah. And also hospital-based depression and anxiety questionnaires is also a validated questionnaire too. Yeah. And yeah. I see yeah. Eric has a question coming in too. Eric? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> First of all, uh, uh, thank you, Carl, for taking the time to present to us. I found your presentation really interesting. Um, I have a question, first of all, which is uh, it's kind of pointy, but it, it opens up to a larger question. I was a little bit surprised to see smoking come out as a, <clears throat> as a risk factor in a number of the studies. And it's a bit difficult for me to imagine kind of how smoking per se would be a causal factor in leading to mental disorders, which makes me wonder if it's not like a proxy for kind of, especially in, in more recent decades for <clears throat> kind of choosing a more marginal lifestyle, factors that are associated, more psychological factors that could lead to mental illness. Uh, I'll, I'll give you two answers that may be not quite the same, but uh... There is uh, some literature from uh, uh, a researcher called Keynes uh, in, in the US looking at cohorts, smoking in cohorts over time in the US. And certainly her finding is that uh, more recent cohorts that the, there's a greater intensity between smoking and uh, people who become depressed. So that the changing or the overall pattern of uh, smoking has changed so that the People who remain smoking, yes, there are more marginal. There, there is a strong literature that though has suggested that smoking is related to, um, um, sorry, mother smoking is related to uh, psychopathology and offspring. And now there's uh, an interesting study that I think was published in, was it, I think it was JAMA. Uh, and it was uh, using Swedish data and, and sibling controls, which are not perfect, but they're okay. And which they found that it wasn't so much the smoking, but rather something about the, the household or the, or, uh, that was important. So I think the, the, the issue, that, that issue is, uh, is, is still there. Um, you, if you look at a lot of data, you'll find a relationship between smoking and, uh, um, and depression and, and other things. But I think the question, the question you're asking is, is smoking really a confounder? In, yes, in the, exactly. In, in the whole, city. and it, it's possible that it is, yeah. but you shouldn't smoke yeah. anyways, because you shouldn't want to get lung cancer, but that's another issue. Right, right, right. But whether it's a, a causative agent in, in, in uh, depression, I, I, I don't know, but uh, it, it certainly changed over time. And uh, maybe, yes, it, it may be a, a confounder rather than a, an actual causal agent by itself. Yeah, okay. Thanks. If I may, just one more question that <laughs> could get a very long answer, but there's not many minutes. But I was a bit surprised that you didn't talk about social media as uh, I mean, I think we, we definitely see an increase in uh, kind of ER visits, uh, hospitalizations in Canada uh, from mental illness that at least seems to coincide with widespread use of smartphones with social media on them by adolescents. Any thoughts about that? And, 
well, possible I, prevention? Well, well no, I, actually, I, when you asked that question, I was thinking of my training as a sociologist, which, which I got my PhD in sociology. Uh -huh. And, you know, there's going back to Durkheim and suicide, and, uh, you know, there's certainly some literature that talks about an imit uh, uh, imitation or contagion effect. Yes. Uh, and I think, yes, there, there is some of that. Certainly when you look at some suicides, particularly suicides in isolated communities, you'll find some uh, contagion effect that does happen. So I would put the social media under the contagion. But how do... That doesn't address the question of how the social media would cause mental illness, nor I, what could be done to prevent that pathway to mental illness. Well, but the, I mean, I think that for me, there's a two way, there's a two, two, two way sword there. Um, on the one hand, you don't want, uh, you want to make uh, people uh, able to talk about mental illness to be able to, you know, say that I have a problem in sharing about it, because I think it's important when people deal with chronic diseases that to recognize that they're not unique, they're not alone, that's very important. But on the other hand, you may, you're talking about uh, talking about mental illness, maybe uh, has people thinking about that they have a mental illness when they don't have a mental illness, is that what you're suggesting? No, no, no. no not at all. No, what, what, I, what I'm suggesting is, uh, from the little bit I've read about it, uh, the use of social media makes youth um, vulnerable. They, they, their, their egos are more vulnerable to begin with. And kind of, it's not no longer just in school time that they're liable to be criticized for not being attractive enough, particularly for girls. Um, it's now 24-7. Uh, mm -hmm. They have the opportunity to, they put out, I mean, I've heard <laughs> young people talk to me about this, sort of putting out pictures of themselves, at least for girls, not wearing a whole lot and waiting to see how many likes they get. And they can do that like 24-7. So, so there, there, it's, it seems to sort of prey on, on vulnerabilities of youth uh, and thus kind of increase anxiety levels. Anyway, I, I'm not sure that this is all super well established, but there's certainly Gene Twenge and others have written about this. There's certainly people who think that this is what's going on. So that I was more wanting to get your take on that. Well, I, I don't, I'm not on Twitter or Facebook. Uh, so, uh, or TikTok. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, I, uh, I think for kids that are vulnerable, that, 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 that is an issue. I mean, that really what you're talking about is some adolescents who are uh, seeking approval yes. from others. Yes. And I think if you have a firm attachment and a, 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 and a strong sort of parental bond, I, I'm not sure that that, that is where people would go to seek uh, uh, approval. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But I'm, I mean, adolescence is a, a time when, when that happens. Right. That right. You, you, you know, peers become more important than parents, definitely, uh, in that kind of process. But it, maybe the, the, it would be also a question of what kind of peer group they have, what kind of uh, intimate personal, sorry, uh, personal relationships, sort of one-on-one -on -one interactions they have with other peers, as opposed to having all the interactions occur in their um, outline. Mm -hmm. But that that's not just true of, of adolescents. I mean, I know adults that seem to think everybody was interested about what they ate yesterday and yeah. stuff like that and post it on the website and so forth. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And in the interest of time, I think uh, we will, you know, end the, the seminar here. And if you have questions, please, you know, contact me or, you know, I will forward that email to Dr. Darcy. Thank you very much, Dr. Darcy, for your wonderful presentation. Okay. Thank you, Jean-Pierre.